enough time, you can actually train a congregation. It takes a while. It takes a while, but what you have to do is you have to have the leadership's permission to go, whatever you put on the website, whatever you put on the sign outside, whatever you put on the bulletin, you either ignore it or you don't. <laughs> I mean, if you say 245, but I know when I travel with the choir and we become the visitors. I don't ever want to be the rude visitor. <laughs> so one of the questions I have to ask somebody there before the choir sings, so I can communicate that to my choir president so he can be getting them ready because I, I can't be with 19 year olds five minutes before we sing. It doesn't work in my life. And, and, and seeing how they get ready just sends me into another planet and, and they probably don't want to be with me five minutes ahead of time either and, and the way I get ready and the amount of quiet I need. And so one of the questions I always ask everywhere we go is, I know it's advertised, is this a place where you have to give them the church Christ life? And sometimes I'll hear, whoa, oh, 10. Uh, and I'm like, really? Well, you can start early, but half the people won't be here. I said, well, I'm not the one that programmed them, but great, we'll start late. Okay. So um, I try when I can control things to get, get it cranking and, and get it on time. All right. It's just not possible for me to tell you how much I love this piece of music. It is incredible. It's the next one in your packet. There's a mouthful, isn't it? Aurelius Clemens Prudentius. He's a Roman Christian poet, approximately 348 to 413, as best we can tell. Practiced law twice, was provincial governor, Towards the end of his life, he decided, I'm, I'm just done with public life. And I think I want to become an ascetic. I think I want to spend my time fasting, abstaining from animal food, writing poems, writing hymns. He didn't get a lot of time to do that in his life. Uh, but he did leave us this text. It's from a larger work, Corde Natus Ex Parentis, from about 405, eventually translated in 1854 by the Englishman John Mason Neal. The reason it's one of my favorites is it's very chant-based. If you look at the top right, You'll see plain song. That is a musical descriptor and synonym for chant. Whenever you see the word plain song, you'll know that something is directly chant based. And, and this is. At some point, somebody came along and put in these other notes to create harmony. But that's not how it had been heard for hundreds of years. And so, we're not going to do the harmony. We're going to monk out. <laughs> and we're going to sing this like we would Gregorian chant. So, if you notice, this is important uh, for you to embrace everything that chant is. Look at the beginning. Where's the time signature? There isn't one. There's no time signature. Why is that? What controlled the rhythm of the music? The cadence of the words. It's another reason why I love Gregorian chant. We generally do something either Renaissance or chant based every year with my college concert choir because it forces them to understand. Have you ever heard us 
you know we spend a lot of time making sure you can understand every word that we say. Because that's a huge thing of mine as, as a choral musician. If, if our diction is bad, we might as well be uh, an orchestra or a band. Not that those are bad, it's just they don't have words to try to understand. So um, when we do have words, it's imperative that they be understood. Well, part of doing that correctly, in my opinion, is also declamation. Which syllable gets the right emphasis? <laughs> and chant is such a wonderful way of doing that because the music was written in such a way that it kind of just flows to stress syllables. Of the Father's love begotten. It, it, it just... You, you use these pitches and almost sing it exactly how you would say it. So, what we're going to do, they have the phrases marked off by those little lines, and we will observe those. Um, if you treat the quarter notes just like there's two eighth notes, and you keep that eighth note going in your head, the Father's love began one to ere the world began to be. He is Alpha and Omega. He the source, the ending. And then that's how it will flow. Is, is we'll be thinking eighth note, so every eighth note just gets one, every quarter note just gets two. We don't need to have a meter because we have a rhythm and meters are about forced stress that, that's the whole purpose of it if we're in duple meter one two one two one two down beats are always strong one two one da da dee da 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 dee da 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 bum 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 da dee bum Da, da, da. Yeah, duple meter hits you in the face every 4th of July music. If at no other time in your life. Because that's, the, that's, that's the, the meter of March. Every March is written in duple meter. Triple meter, even going back to, to uh, classical times, when, when these things were codified, has always been the rhythm of dance. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One. All the waltzes by Tchaikovsky's ballets. Mozart from Don Giovanni. One, two, and three, and one, two, and three. Well, it's called the minuet. It's in minuet and trio form. Minuet was the dance of the time. Very different than the dance of our time. <laughs> but dance music has traditionally been triple meter. Quadruple is three is stronger than two and four, but not as strong as one. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And that helps us organize those stress patterns. Well, chant has none of that which is why we don't mess with them, and why it, it, it's so beauti beautiful, uh, I, I, think, I think very ethereal <clears throat> sounding. Um, when I'm getting my students to try to do this kind of music correctly, uh, my dissertation was on the, the role of imagery in singing, uh, because I just don't think everybody can understand the anatomy involved in making sound the way I do in such a way for me to communicate that to them and have them do everything exactly the way I mean it. And you're not stupid people. You just don't have my training. So if my approach to this is, okay, I need you to purposely manipulate your cricoarytenoid cartilage and, and try to, you know, see right there, most of you are just like, well, why didn't he go ahead with one of those? Dude, are you allowed to say that in public? You know, those kind of things. Those kind of things. My choir is no different. My choir is no different. The brain is an amazing thing. 
It's an amazing thing. And when I tell my choir, close your eyes. And if you've been in one of them in person, you haven't, and you've seen pictures, imagine the most spacious, gorgeous cathedral you've ever seen or imagined in your life. And imagine the kind of music that was written to be sung in a space like that. And when I drop my hand, give me what you think that sound means to you. Every one of their brains will tell their bodies to do something. And it is stunning how much more effective it is when you can communicate with images than when you have to communicate with exact musculature and all that kind of stuff. So what we're after here is a, is a very, very light, ethereal kind of sound. We, we don't want the American operatic. Of a father's love begotten. It's not opera. It's chant. Of a father's love begotten. That's different. That's different. It's really cool if you let yourself think about music enough to do subtle differences like that. Because when we don't, it's like coming over to this window, and you know, it's a pretty window. It really is. It's very functional. Every bit of light that comes through there looks identical. And there's a church off the square downtown, the big Methodist church that has the most ginormous, round, stained glass window in it. And if you've ever been inside that church when the sun is shining, and you see the sun through a stained glass window, why would you ever want that? That's functional, but compared to the other, it's ugly. But, you know, At least kind of in my neck of woods and from my travels with the choir. It's interesting how we envision stewardship in our lives in the various ways. Because there are some exceptions to this when I travel. But by and large, if you find visibly the ugliest structure you possibly can find, it will probably say Church of Christ in front of it. <laughs> because we, we just, for whatever reasons, don't care a lot about art. We don't care about the visual, the eye appeal of something. When I walk into the Catholic Church here, it takes my breath away. Looking at all the stations of the cross, that gives me a visual image of something that I don't have to conjure up in my own brain. And I find them beautiful, personally. I just, I just find them beautiful. I've even given a concert before we had Bartholomew in that sanctuary called Great Cathedral Works, where we, throughout the ages we sang music that should have been sung in a space like that, in a space like that. It was a great concert, and it was one of the it was one of the funniest things that's ever happened in my life while I've been here. Because I was talking um, to Father, whoever it was at the time. It took me 15 minutes to convince him it was okay for us to sing there. He said, yeah. Boy, that would be great. Our church would love that. I think that would be great. Clark, will they let you sing here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be okay. We talked a little bit more. Now, are you sure? Yeah. You're, you're in the Church of Christ, right? Yeah, and they're going to let you come in. Yes, they're going to let me come into a Catholic building. It's a concert. It's a concert. Everything's going to be fine. I, it took me 15 minutes to convince him we would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was interesting. Um, so, all right. We're going to sing this now. This great chant. Oh, so me 
You don't lead songs. You lead worship. You are a worship leader. And if you will get that through your head, that will change how you prepare and what you do when you're in front leading the people who are worshiping with you. It's a different filter. Um, so, you're kind of stuck with my opinion this week, and that's one of them. Uh, I, I think it has served me well. Um, at least here at the college it has. I've clearly fooled them for 31 years in a row. They did give me a contract for next year. I signed. It's already a done deal. So so I, I whatever I'm doing, I'm going to keep doing it and hope I keep fooling them uh, for a little bit longer. Uh, all right. Um, that brings us to the next one. Father, we praise Thee. Pope Gregory the First, or Alcuin of York, or Anonymous from the 10th century. <laughs> it does, and sometimes that's about as exact as some of this can get. So, we talked already about Pope Gregory and how he codified chant. 
one of the most famous people <laughs> in all the music and literature. We don't know anything about that. Alcuin of York. Charlemagne said, I want you to come on, be part of my Carolingian court. Because Charlemagne, he, he believed in the trivium and the quadrivium, which were those anchors of, of education. Uh, the trivium, grammar, logic, rhetoric. The quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, music, astronomy. Those were the anchors of what people started educating other people with in ancient Greece. But he also thought into that they should bring some more of the liberal arts, including religion. So um, I like Charlemagne for that part of what he did. Um, he actually, Alcuin, became a leading scholar and teacher there. Um, when Einhard wrote his book, Life of Charlemagne, he called Alcuin the most learned man anywhere to be found. He not only taught Charlemagne, he taught his sons, Pepin and Louis, and any other young men that were sent to him, either in the court or in his role later as a cleric. So regardless who this springs from, it springs from a, a, a pretty good place. Uh, yeah, we already talked about that the other day. Translated into English in 1906 by Percy Dearmer. So let's go ahead and do we have another packet? Yeah. Do, you, do you need music, Bob? This is Clark voice. Just your brother. 
Um, my preference is to put as much onus on the worshiper as you possibly can. They are there to be active, not to have things done to them. So, what I prefer, and I will do that sometimes, I will do that sometimes, but by and large, I want to create the kind of place that's safe enough where if you see that word stand, and, and the spirit either of God or of within you lets you stand up and 50 people around you are gawking at you, then you stand, brother, and let them gawk. And let us not judge. And if you feel the spirit in a song and you raise those hands and there are people around you like, what in the world are they doing that? That's where people like me have to pray that I don't take my hands and smack those people <laughs> for thinking those kind of things in the middle of worship service. I mean, we were given emotions by God on high. How we use them can be bad, yes, but I, I don't think showing that we are moved by music and text in worship is abusing the emotions that he gave us. I have never thought that. I will never think that. I want people to feel free to do whatever it is they do when I'm leading. Because I know what I feel. But I don't want to force everything I feel on you if you don't feel it that way. But are we safe enough to allow people to stand, sit, kneel, Whatever response to you, uh, the spirit of the music, the spirit of the text calls for, I think that should be allowed. I had the most riveting experience in my life uh, as I was growing up. And I grew up in a very non-traditional congregation. There was a congregation in Des Moines, Iowa, that the uh, college church in Searcy paid an evangelist to be a preacher and minister there. There was another congregation in Des Moines, Iowa, where they paid another evangelist to be a minister. And they thought, you know, there is no church over on the bad side of town. And when I was growing up, that's what South Des Moines was. I don't, I don't know if it still is, but, you know, even the high school years, like, well, I'm not going there. You know, one of those kind of things. You know, well, there were five families the Lutzenheiser family, the Deal family, the Rausch family, a single woman, and Lloyd's parents. <coughs> they got my parents to move from Clinton, Iowa. My dad took a job for the state. And that was back in the days when we did campaigns. We did a bunch of them. And in five years, we had gone from five families to 200 people in that part of town. I saw a bunch of things I had never seen in different churches before. I just know I was raised in a setting where if somebody walked off the street and into our service and they were in a halter top and you could see the white of their pockets underneath where their jeans were cut, They'd come back the next week is how they were treated. That, that's the kind of church I was raised in and I've looked for the rest of my life. Hard to find. It's very hard to find. And that's that's an analysis more than it is a criticism to me. Um, it, it, it was just a very, very, very special thing. It was during one of those Sundays and we had a visitor. And something about the worship service struck him. And what everybody saw was this person bolt up the side aisle, go up by the baptistry, go down on their knees, raise their hands. Okay, none of this is normal in a normal church of Christ. <laughs> so everybody is kind of like, what, 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 what do we do? What do we do? Well, guess who was the song leader that day? <laughs> you know, it must have been the invitation song or something. And I was just like, oh my goodness. And so I just stopped. And I went over and I said, how can we help you? Because whatever you need is more important than what we're doing right now. And he said, I just want Jesus to save me.
I'm telling you. I made an impression on this teenager that clearly I have never forgotten. And would there be anything wrong if all of our assemblies were so opaque and transparent and open that somebody felt they could do that every week? Yeah, amen. Woo! Woo! Man, we all have building programs. <laughs> so, you know, you know our, our past it doesn't have to dictate everything, but, but it does personally make us who we are. And just being, just being raised in, 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 a, in a place like that has, has given me some filters on, on, on the way we should be and the way I think that, that, that God's people should be. And I think worship is serious business. I think it's serious business. And how many times have I seen Sunday night, Wednesday night, did you take care of this for us? That's what Joe could say. Yeah, we'll have a closing prayer. And he's picking out songs 30 seconds before the service is beginning. And I'm like, come on, people. Really? Even if you don't want to go to the planet of, you don't think God deserves better than that? Do you not think His people deserve better than that? If Sunday mornings count, do Sunday night, do Wednesday, we don't act like they often do. There should be the same amount of planning and preparation and serious thought every time God's people get together. I have one hymnal at home. It's got slash marks all the way through it. So if I want to go to, we praise thee, O God, for the Son of my love. I can see Clark, you've already led that five times this year. <laughs> Do we need that another time? Or is there another text I might possibly be able to bring to us? How would I know that if I didn't keep track? You're like, dude, man, take a chill pill. Not with worship. No. No, not, not with worship. It, it, it is the one corporate thing we all do together. We don't all preach together. We don't all pray out loud together. This is the one thing we do together. Let's take it seriously. As seriously as these people took the writing of these texts. And, uh, okay. Moving on. Uh, we'll get stuck there. I'll get stuck there. All glory, Lord, and honor. Adolf of Orleans. Writer, poet, again, during the reign of Charlemagne. Key member, of again, of the Carolingian dynasty. He was kind of up there with Alcuin as, as, as one of the twin cool dudes. Um... He was named by Charlemagne uh, Bishop of Orléans around 798. Is that right? Yes. Here is what he thought about hospitality. Should we not always keep the door open and never refuse pilgrims, travelers, or the poor if they need a meal or a place to stay for the night? He believed that you had to offer the less fortunate a seat at your dinner table if you one day wished to have a seat at the banquet of God. Highly influenced by his readings of Augustine. That's enough right there for me to go. Okay, I need to spend more time with this dude. He's had significant thoughts filling his brain um, and spilling out. All right. Um, Originally, Glory Aus et Ona, 2821, translated again by John Mason Neal in 1851. And off we go. Mm -hmm. All glory, Lord. Oh, 
comest, the King and Blessed One, the company of angels are praising Thee on high, and mortal men and all things created make reply. The people of the Hebrews with palms before Thee went, our praise and prayer by one year. And outside of that, I, I have the longest tenure. I beat Dr. Wheeler by one year. Um, the three of us have been here a long time. And I just want to thank you for whatever support you give us, whether it be just showing up and nourishing our spirits, whether it be supporting what we're trying to do here with the students. There's almost a part of me that feels like, you know, bad me if, if, if I don't stop for a minute and you know, they're, they're sick, the besties. How could they have known the impact their daughter was going to have on this campus when they sent their little baby to go to college? I don't know that you could have, but wow. Y'all and God did a great thing with her. I'm so blessed to have her as a colleague. And I believe if I have the story right, they were baptized after studying with Ted and Janet Mountjoy, whose son stood on my risers, who now is my boss. <laughs> um, I, I've had the blessing of, of, of knowing the Morrows and their, and their children and they came here and um, of course Tally David's uh, wife, their daughter-in-law will maybe arguably be the greatest second soprano I have taught in my entire career by the time I'm Sides. How, 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 they love this place. How could they have known the impact their children would have on this place? Holly. And now Glenn is back to influence more in even a more direct way as, as, he, as he breaks the bread uh, from the east of all the Saffronite family. My, my goodness. Um, it's the hardest thing in the world presently for me not to play favorites with your grandson. Because I just adore him so much. And your granddaughter. Uh, and and uh, I, I've just been blessed to be here long enough um, to have known many of your families and, and, and the way they impacted things. And I, don't, I don't think the Sheldons when they sent little Todd, when he was little Todd, if he was ever little Todd, uh, to York, would, would have known that he would one day uh, sit in the same office as Father did and, and carry on, you know, the tradition. Uh, there, there's just so much for me to be grateful for. That shame on me 
if I don't stop and let some of you know, thank you. Thank you for who you are and who you are and the people you have sent our way and how God has used those people and woven them into the fabric of my heart and how they have helped form me as a professional and, and as a man of God. And I, I just wanted to take a couple minutes before the week gets away from us. And I was just like, oh, that was a really cool thought you had, dude. <laughs> well, say it. Say it to them. Um, th this wonderful man over here. I have to share this story with you. Because this is epic. Crawford W. Lawrence. It, they had hired me in 1986. And oh my... Goodness, was I in my 20s. <laughs> oh my. And uh, so I go to my very first division meeting, the old humanities division. And so, of course, I'm there early because I'm the new guy and I don't want to do anything wrong, you know? So I'm sitting there and I don't even know if he remembers this. I'll never forget it. But Dr. Bob walks in. I did not know him as I do now. This is the first conversation we ever had. Ever. He sits behind me and I turn around. Not, hi, I'm Dr. Lawrence. Not any, he knew who I was. So he leans up and he goes, is there music in heaven? <laughs> and I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> and I'm like, well, well sir, I believe that there is. Were angels created? <laughs> well, I believe they just always were. So, music is eternal. That was the first conversation I ever had with this man. And he has blessed my life so richly. So richly. If you were to walk into my office, you would see what is the dearest thing in that office to me. And one year, for some occasion, and I'm not an occasion person at all. I think they were created by Hallmark. But um, <laughs> I, I had just let it slip out. And that's all you have to do if you have a precious life, is you let something slip out. You don't remember you said it, and then all of a sudden later, boom, here comes this thing. And, 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 and for something, for Christmas or Father's Day, for my, I don't know, for something. She had gone to his house. Because I had said, I just feel like my office would be holistically complete if it had a Dr. Bob clock in it. <laughs> and so to this day, I have a Dr. Bob <laughs> clock on my bookshelf, old enough that you have to wind it so it'll chime and wind it so it'll run. And I believe the tag he gave me that came along with it says tumble clock for the 1880s. That he had kept in working order all that time. And when you have those kind of people contributing to your nature and your spirit and, and who you are becoming, periodically it, it really does behoove you to just stop what you're doing and in all humility to say thank you. Thank all of you for who you are, for the family members that, that, that have touched our lives here, maybe in exponential ways none of us could imagine, especially some of them when we saw them as students. We are like, oh, whew. well, we all grow up. And, and uh, to God be the glory and, and to God be praised. Uh, I just want to say how much 
I appreciate those people in our audience and specifically, as well as the rest of you who have come up year after year after year and, and made us believe that what we're doing here matters. You, you, you can't, there's, there's less gratitude in what we do than you might think. And that should be hard for you to believe because 18 and 19 is not wired to say thank you a lot. <laughs> but we are refreshed by doing weeks like this. We're exhausted when it's done. But so are you. <laughs> but thank you for coming. Um, all right, 307. Jesus, the very thought of thee. We're going to sing that and then we're going to close. And then we'll talk about Bernard on Friday because we've got some other hymns by him as well. <clears throat>